this is Sheila Bender, and you're listening to In Conversation, discussions on writing and the writing life. Today, we are talking with Steve DeJarnett, who is speaking to us from the University of Ohio area, where he is currently a visiting professor teaching in the MFA program, both screenwriting and TV writing. He grew up in Longview, Washington, where he briefly held the state high school track record in the quarter mile and attended Occidental College in L.A., ultimately graduated from Evergreen State College, where they had good film equipment, and then completed a creative writing MFA program at Antioch University in Los Angeles. He's well noted for directing the indie feature film Miracle Mile, among many other film and television credits, which include work with the series ER and others. He does live in Port Townsend, Washington, when he's not teaching in Ohio. And today, I'm so happy to welcome you to our program, Steve. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It's, it's a thrill. Uh, one of the thrills for me was even finding out about you, which you remember, we never actually personally met. But you were ahead of me in line at the mail store. And you were telling, uh, yeah. <laughs> you were telling the proprietor, Gordon, that your film, Miracle Mile, had just come out on Blu-ray, I think is what you said. And I didn't hear the name of the film, but I heard your enthusiasm. I heard that it was a film. And you left after presenting him with, I think, a box of DVDs, maybe. Yeah, I've shipped, I've shipped a lot of stuff. Out of right. the store, yeah. I asked him if maybe he could connect us, which he did, because I thought, wonderful. We have a screenwriter right here in Port Townsend who I'd like to interview for the conversation. And here we are finally with our studio date. And then you revealed to me that you were a short fiction writer. And it was so lovely that you had the people at the printery print out three of your short fiction pieces that had been published in prestigious places, including the Best American Short Stories of 2009. Alice Siebold was the guest editor. And yeah. you write in your bio notes there, that was the first story you'd ever sent out and never expected it to get published. Yeah, I won the, the Powerball the first time I bought a ticket, so it's all downhill since, since then, really. <laughs> wow. All the time that much, and that's not a joke? I didn't really realize how awesome of a thing that is, and it was the f- first time I sent a story out anywhere, and, you know, magazine, you know, got a few rejections, Santa Monica Review picked it up, and a year later, you get an email telling <laughs> you you're in that, the book with the big-time people, so right. it will never be that easy <laughs> <laughs> well, but then you went on to publish in some other very nice journals, New England Review, an anthology called New Stories from the Midwest, and a whole list that you've sent on to me, Cincinnati Review, and other very well-known literary magazines. So you have a very rich and full writing experience. And as an interview, I'm really interested in how you, as a person with some success with screenwriting and directing, decided to go to an MFA program in fiction. I sort of had a similar experience in the film business that I made a short film. It was regarded pretty well, and I was offered films off it, and then I sort of turned down a whole other career I could have to make the film you mentioned, Miracle Mile, sort of my main one, and then later worked in television. But I worked for like, I don't know, 25 straight years. It was just getting harder to find work, and I just decided I wanted to go learn a new craft that I could do for the duration of my <laughs> my life that you don't need a million dollars to go do. And so went back to school and was sort of open to really learning the craft of fiction, which I think is way different than film writing, which I don't take that seriously. Could you address some of the differences that you find? A script can really read well, but it's really just sort of this blueprint. People don't read it closely. The notes that you get from studio people generally are great little kernel of an idea, now let's do this whole other thing. And Whereas editing and fiction is, they're trying to help you tell your story. And I also work a lot harder at it. When I wrote film scripts, I'd write a draft and think you're done. And, you know, in fiction, I don't think you're ever done. You, you write 40 revisions on your own and then get feedback and get notes from editors. So it's... And you enjoy that. More. It, it sounds like um, it's... Well, I, I enjoy... Yeah, the, actually, the notes... <laughs> from people so far anyway, they're trying to help you tell your story better rather than sort of, what if we did this to your story? Mm-hmm. It, and it's been unexpected to have to, de- to to deal that. I mean, I'm used to being professional in the film business, and you have to be ready f- to go in every, any direction they want to if they're paying you. Uh-huh. <laughs> anyway, So the short fiction is you. It's what you want to 
explore? Well, starting now, and I mean, I really was so not particularly well read. I mean, when I used to read books for back when I was doing film, I, it would be like sort of skimming it, going, "Where's the movie in it?" And now I care about the sentences and the rhythms, and sort of been savoring it, and have learned where commas go and how to use semicolons and M dashes <laughs> and uh, all that. And then now when you read a screenplay, it's all the grammar and everything is so loose. You, I kind of don't take it that seriously. If, if the story is being told well, that's really all that matters in a screenplay. Yeah, and it's such a collaborative process, as you're describing them. By yeah. the end, it's it's a lot of people involved. Before we get to hearing you read from your short fiction, which I'm really eager to hear, I know that from your bio that you grew up in Longview, Washington, and right. ultimately came back to Washington twice, once for Evergreen and then again now to live in Port Townsend. How does a person who grew up in Longview get excited about L.A. and deal with the, the great difference between the coastal places here and busy L.A.? I think maybe it's because the, the snow out here or whatever, too. I I'm missing L.A. and Port Townsend. It's really glad I grew up in a small town. You know, there's this big, wide world out there that you have to go out and discover. And I don't know. I, I had seen almost no movies growing up except at the drive-in. As you said, I was sort of a more of a jock and just sort of fell into the film business because friends down the hall were making movies. And I don't know. Life in L.A. is sometimes too easy. It's getting a little tougher now with the traffic, but... It's a <laughs> pleasant place to live, except for the driving. So. I see. So you chose Occidental not for film. That just happened because you fell into a group I, that was doing that. It was kind of, I was going to go to Oregon State on a track scholarship and be an oceanographer. And at the last second, I had visited Occidental, and we were going to have a great mile relay team. And, and they offered me sort of a need scholarship instead of a sports one. I had a whole bunch of full ride offers. I sort of hit myself sometimes because I did turn down a full ride to Stanford. <laughs> mm -hmm. I probably would have flunked out, never would have fallen into film. And then I got injured quickly in college, so that wasn't going to be my life ongoing anyway. But yeah, I got the film bug, did two and a half years at Oxy, as they call Occidental. Not quite the same time as Barack Obama. When he when he was Barry Obama, he, he lived in the next dorm a few years later. Then. Oh. But he went there for two years as well. And then, yeah, went to Evergreen because, yeah, they had great film gear and was just starting out. And Matt Groening lived across the hall and was wow. quite a time. <laughs> Very good time. And then you went back to L.A. and started and, making yeah. films. And then I went to the AFI and I, you know, I just, and I made a short sort of film noir movie with some great character actors. And sort of once that got made, I had a career to, to squander. And that's the American <laughs> Film Institute. Uh, yeah. You're talking about. Yeah. Well, I think it's all very exciting, as most of us think when we think about people who get active in the business and have success. But it's very heartwarming to know that you enjoy what you called the craft that could take you from here on out. It was something that you really enjoyed and were interested in. So maybe this is the right time for you to give us a little reading of your short fiction. Okay. Let me see if I get a little later. And if, I, if you hear some purring, I have a couple of cats jumping on me right now, but... I'll preface this story. This is a story that was in Cincinnati Review, and then it was in the new stories of the Midwest, and also I think it made the 100 notable stories in the back of the Best American Short Stories in 2013. It's loosely based on a true incident or true occurrence in Nebraska, 2008. Every state has a haven law where you know you can drop off a baby at a firehouse or a hospital usually up to a year, and the state will take care of it. In Nebraska, when they wrote their law, they didn't put an age in it. So you could actually drop off a 17-year-old or an entire family, and this is sort of about a bunch of characters heading towards the border before the laws change to sadly jettison their children. And uh, I'm going to read the beginning of it, which is just sort of one of the five characters. It's sort of an ensemble piece called Mulligan. They are drawn now from all directions, families down to their last drop of hope, coming through the gauntlet of a gathering storm to the dead center of America. They have until midnight to cross the border here in the Cornhusker State before the music stops. 
Arabelle Tunney drives a rusted Ford camper, exactly the posted limit, heading east out on Highway 70. The comforting drone of engine and wind pierced by a shrill wave of young laughter. Simmer down back there, simmer down, she shouts to her children in the rear. Arabelle buried her husband Earl under the turnips out in the truck patch late Tuesday night. His kidneys gave out at long last. Earl had a well-documented history of renal trouble, but the warfare and lace stew she fed him the last few days probably helped the reaper do his work. The bastard Earl kept Arabelle knocked up without mercy, seeding her womb, his property so-called, with seven children in six years and a bun on the way, because the Lord told him to. She hid away inside her ample girth, only her ornery toes would betray feelings sometimes, making the sounds of animals scuffling under a rug, clicking and squirming down in the fortress of her hard shoes. She's leaving hell back in the beehive state en route to the high plains of freedom and a second chance at everything. It's not just mouths to feed with no option but for charity that has her in distress the six-year sum of all that's been inflicted on a child bride thrown into such cruel arrangement. Arabelle longs to know so much, Google, travel, tender love, but she's known only pampers, breastfeeding, and the sting of a backhand slap. Five girls and two boys. The brood is growing now, and eldest Dora can help some with the toddlers. These angels of hers should bring joy, but they reflect only some blank engulfing sorrow. Sometimes when Arabel looks their way, they have no faces. Sometimes their voices scree like wounded birds, and their eyes swirl like funhouse pinwheels. She craves a week of narcotic sleep, maybe a year of it, to not for goddamn once have something leeching off her blood, her milk, her time. The children look out windows, greased with nose prints, searching the lateral flow of countryside for white horses and old barns, a contest to pass the time. As they sing an old hymn, their off-key harmonies reach deep into Arabella's brain and begin to turn the red-hot screws again. You are listening to KPTZ 91.9 Port Townsend. In case you've just joined us, you're listening to In Conversation with Sheila Bender, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life. Today, Sheila is talking with screen and short fiction writer Steve DeJarnett about his career in film and TV and his later interest in writing literary fiction. That's only part of the story, and then the story you said. Well, that's the intro for one character, and then there's a few other characters that are on their way, and you, you sort of intercut them as they sort of make it to a firehouse and... Right. It's a very good story. I thank you for having it printed out for me. This is the one that people can find in, is it New Stories from the Midwest? New Stories from the Midwest. You know, I'm hopefully trying not to sell a collection until I have the beginning of a novel because publishers don't really want collections or you have to just kind of dump it out there. But hopefully that'll be out sometime and before too long. Once well, they, you know, This summer I'll get back to it. Oh, good. Well, there are three... Um, I've gotten to read happily three very strong stories, and it makes me sad that that idea. And it's true, though, that pe- it's hard to sell short stories. On the other hand, people love short stories, so it's, it's uh, that's uh, all I read. So I don't understand that. I would. Uh, I don't I mean, either. I'm a pretty slow, uh, deliberate reader, and I mean, I do read novels, but I devour short stories. And I think the publishing industry needs to figure a way to market it. It's really their, Absol- right. their fault, not the writer's fault. Absolutely. So. And of course, there's a lot of online opportunity for short stories that have lively readership. So it's really oh, interesting yeah. Yeah. that the legacy publishers don't seem to think they can sell short stories. So I'm sure you'll make a great novel, and then people will want to well, read your short <laughs> stories. I think I may, you know, when I write a novel, I may go... I've sort of tried to avoid some of my cinematic 
things in, in sort of going more into characters' heads and the you know the rhythm of the sentences. And However, and what I hear yeah. is a, a structure born of your experience in this story, as you describe it, a structure born of your screen writing and filmmaking and directing experience because really? well, oh yeah intercut you use that word uh, that the, yeah. the three characters all driving to the same location are intercut and that was really compelling as i read the story uh, well, to well. go from character but as you do with arabella we have enough of a sense of that character and their situation and their feelings which is the thing you're concentrating on to want to come back to them when it's their turn again uh-huh. yeah. in your story I know from another story of yours that I read, which is about an injured vet who has uh, dropped into addiction because of his pain and sorrow and is now being kind of cold turkey off his drugs because of, I think, an aunt who's keeping him locked up. (laughs) But it is happening just before the levees break from Katrina. And we're concerned with him and if he's going to survive. And it has a nice surprise ending. Well, you get to the very end. I, I do put the character through yes, quite which... a few levels of hell, and uh, even at the end, he's kind of well. You have to read the story. That, that one, I don't know if that's online, but it's well. It that is. right, that's the one in the yeah. best American short stories right, of right. of uh, two thousand and nine. So those books are always available. Those anthologies yeah, and yeah, the year probably anthologies. any library would have that right. Yes. But I, I see even there the cinematic when he is aware of what's outside his window and what's in the attic where he is and the sound of the water rising is all very rich and very full. And a lot of writers have a really hard time learning to create place. Coming from film, place is always really important, even if it's... It is. You have to go, you know, exterior, blah, blah, we hear this. So... Yeah, those sort of sensory details, I think, come naturally to the if you're, and you're particularly if you're a director too, because when you write your scripts, you're kind of putting the soundtrack and all that in there. Right. So another thing I notice about your work is this political bent. I mean, from a very, <laughs> the characters all have personal investment in escaping something, and I'm interested in your politics. Why? Why it well, is you choose to write? characters who have political situations or the, you know or, i do i do get politics in there a little bit and i and i'm told this i'm not really aware of it even in rubio i guess a, a certain not defined but spiritual thing or something mm-hmm. too or at least people trying to find grace or redemption now growing up in longview my dad was a high school history teacher and my coach but he also was a state senator in fact he was uh Patty Murray was his protege in the state senate when they were in, in the senate together in, in, in Olympia years ago, and so I grew up, you know, in the Democratic Party, <laughs> being in politics. Certainly, care about events now. So yeah, I mean, to me, I probably do want to change the world incrementally if I can when I write a story. Or Miracle Mile certainly was about the Cold War threat and. And all the, the the weapons we have out there, and trying to scare the hell out of people uh-huh. to, to do something about that. Do you see any progress? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, the Cold War ended just be- just as the movie was coming out. But, <laughs> people watched uh, your film. I love, and tell, <laughs> I love to tell audiences though, and, and today when I run the film, that it's more likely to happen tonight. I don't want to give away Miracle Mile, but it is based on you know Cold War scenarios than when it was set back in the in the eighties. And it still seems to play very well on Blu-ray, and I've had screenings in all over the country, and there's one scheduled around the world, and Seattle Film Festival is going to do another big sort of retro event sometime next summer, I think. But And it's included, Miracle Mile. <laughs> well, Mar- yeah, Miracle Mile, and then probably this short uh, film noir thing called Tarzana, and then I even see another lesser movie, but has a follow called Cherry 2000, sort of a road warrior thing that also came out on Blu-ray, and then have a writing credit on a silly Canadian movie, uh, Strange Brew, the McKenzie brothers take off you hoser, Bob and Doug McKenzie uh, thing, and that's coming out on Blu-ray next month. So, so. Blu-ray's been a real gift to you, to keep your film Well, it's, it's nice. You, you make these things, they don't exactly make a lot of money. But they have really hardcore followings years later, and sort of people want want a Blu-ray version. Not everything comes out on Blu-ray. Mm-hmm. 
So Miracle Mile went to number one in romance, number three in drama, like number 24 for all of film and television for like two weeks when it came out on Amazon. I don't know how that's possible. but uh, Well, yeah, nobody knows how Amazon works exactly, but it's yeah, thrilling yeah. To, to find that out and, and to hear it. Well, because when you look at later, of course, it's 12,000 or something. So it's when there's a flurry of activity, you get to shoot up the charts with a bullet. Yes, but, yes. You've told us that what's next is a novel. And um, I'm wondering before we have to end today, if you have any advice for younger writers like you must have in your classes, but just your sort of general advice about things you think are important for them to know? Uh, for fiction or for well, film? both. So you can start with one and go I, on to the other. I'm still just learning fiction. I, I really, I mean, I you know, go to Bread Loaf and Tin House and, and all that. And just read, read a workshop. Uh, I mean, I'd love to find, I, you know, I know Adrian uh, Haroon, who I know you've, you've interviewed a right? with her. When I do get up there in the summer, I'd love to find a small group of writers to workshop again because I have not written a lot. This is my first foray into university level academia, so I, I've been kind of swamped with moving and getting my sea legs here. So I'm looking forward to getting back to, to writing. For film, don't try to write something to sell it, write something you care about that you would want to spend you know, a long time making and care about and see a million times. It doesn't have to be something you know, just something that you're passionate about. It could be something you don't know and you investigate, but don't do it trying to make money. Do it because you, cause you want to. And that, you know, that advice people. is based on the outcome of how good it will be or what will keep you thriving and happy? Uh, I just think if you try to be somebody else or try to second guess what somebody else might want, you'll never figure out what you want. And that's the important thing. So, yeah, you could tell a story, you could put it on YouTube, you can, today the writer is sort of king in, in television and long form television and all these new series, which I think, I wrote 15 pilots, but, but it was mainly in the 90s and the early uh, century. I, I may try to get back, get my toe back in the Hollywood waters too, because if you are a writer, television is the place to be, not film. It's That's where... The showrunner, creator gets to tell the directors what to do, gets to sort of have the master vision over a season or several seasons. And television is much more interesting, I think, than the writing. Film today is all special effects and with a few great movies that get made. But all of my friends are still making movies. It's very hard to get them made. Because it's so expensive to make movies? Yeah, you can make you can go make good movies. There's Seattle filmmakers uh, Lynn Shelton and actually Megan Griffiths, who I think lives in Seattle, who went to Ohio University here, and they're they're doing really well. And in the so-called sort of Sundance mumblecore scene, where you you know, go make a feature for fifty thousand dollars or something, but I seem to write stuff that would cost a lot more money. Although I may try to do something on a smaller scale, but I I think I'd rather. Uh, try a new thing. So, so I try to help a lot of people make their first film. Which is excellent. Is that gratifying? Uh, usually, yes, usually. Yeah, because yeah. if you've learned, it's so nice to pass it on. And at the same time, you're exploring new genres for yourself. When you say writing for television, do you include things like the Netflix special? Oh, and absolutely. And- I mean, Amazon is has huge things, and some of my kids are writing web series things that they'll shoot themselves, and whether it's True Detective or, you know, Twin Peaks is coming back, you know, Breaking Bad. Or just, there's really interesting, great TV shows where the writer gets to call the shots more than the director. And, you know, I've done both. I've done writing separately, directing separately, done them together. And I have a lot of fiction friend writers around the country who are trying to get into t- television, too. Mm-hmm. So are there any uh, books or websites you would suggest that people go to if they're interested in following up on the idea of writing for television uh well <laughs> actually through antioch uh university los angeles i am going to be doing workshops i think this summer and also critiquing people's material whether it's screenplays fiction or tv pilots and i'll probably do a tv pilot class online and how would people find too. out about this 
I would say just Facebook me. I, I, I added 2,000 new friends uh, in this last six months when Miracle Mile came out. So I'm posting things there. I don't have a website yet. That's in the work. But, yeah, just friend me on Facebook or send a note or something. And, yeah, it's, I think it's fairly reasonable, too, the Antioch thing. I haven't done it yet, but I've been t- been trained. So to will it be totally online, online, or do people have to go to L.A.? Uh, no, that'll be online. That'll be online. And then I've talked to... Uh, the group downtown too. I think if I'm up there, you know, I might do something in town too. If I'm going to, if I travel a lot too, though, right. so I don't. So when you, you know, say I'll, the I'll, people in town, you're talking about uh, here Port in Port But I mean, yeah. would you do it through one of our venues? Well, yeah. The, what's what's the it's the writers workshop, workshop or whatever? Uh-huh. I, I right. Mean, I'd talk to them, but I'll be up there, but I'll still be traveling. So I, I sort of can't commit to like a weekly thing for. Two months, but you know, maybe in a, come do do something or help out. And well, I, I know I'm going to do something yeah. in Seattle with the Northwest Film Forum as well, uh-huh. and probably at Evergreen too. So. And we can follow all this on Facebook. Yeah, I'll put stuff on right. there, or then when I get a website, I'll certainly right. let you know. So I am going to spell your name for our listeners before we end. <laughs> okay. That's Steve D E then space J A R N A. T-T. So we just find you on Facebook and learn all about our opportunities to work with you. There might be a fake one on there or something that sometimes I've seen, but I, the one that has about 3,000 friends, I don't know who they all are, but I... Right, I that's have, a good clue. Look, yeah. So that's the one, yeah, you'll, yeah, and I'm happy to friend you and keep oh, you Oh, well, thank you. Thanks very yeah. much. Well, it's really been a pleasure to talk with you. I hope when you're back in town, I get to study with you and meet you and maybe have coffee instead of stand behind you okay. in line at the mail store. But that yeah, was, please, <laughs> I wish you would, yeah, tap me on the shoulder and... You know, you're aware of my place there. Then I do let writers stay there sometimes. Too, I am, so. and maybe you want to yeah. tell people about it. So it's a you call it a writing lodge. Well, that's my now. It's my house. I I moved up there like two years ago after sort of renting it out. But but I have let some friend of Adrian and Steve Erickson, who's a big LA writer, some other people have come to stay there when I go down to Los Angeles or mm-hmm. or, or go other places. Right. So. I hope that the snow disappears and you have a lively time in Ohio during the spring. And we'll look forward to seeing you here in Port Townsend. I'm looking forward to it as well. Thank Thank you very much for having me. You have been listening to In Conversation, Discussions on Writing and the Writing Life with Sheila Bender. For more of Sheila's interviews, please go to Sheila's website, www.writingitreal.com slash audio. In Conversation is produced by Sheila Bender and edited by Charlie Fleischman.